I'm trying to think what's changed. Um, so uh, in that introduction, uh, <clears throat> and what's changed uh, for me as a cancer investigator and an immunologist. And I'm sure you've heard Dr. Nimer, you've seen Dr. Swords and many other uh, new members of the center. Um, our bone marrow transplant program, uh, for example, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Komanduri, who came in 2008, has gone uh, from uh, doing 48 transplants uh, a year at Jackson to doing, they'll probably do over 160 transplants this year at Sylvester. They did that literally in the last uh, three years. Um, and, um, and we're beginning to uh, many of you have probably heard about some of the new experimental therapies that uh, uh, have been developed, uh, some at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with CAR T cells, so these uh, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells. This is a very novel uh, therapy that probably will replace marrow transplantation. And um, we're actually uh, opening the first of two trials uh, at the center will be the only center in the southeast United States, one in diffuse large B cell lymphoma and the other in uh, acute lymphoblastic uh, uh, leukemia uh, using CAR T cells. And, and uh, we've actually pulled off a real stunt, don't tell anybody outside this room, but we're working with two different companies that are competing with one another. And so um, we're just uh, in two different diseases, and we'll see. But I, um, the, uh, the, the uh, Talmud says that the jealousy of scribes creates knowledge. And, um, and so um, <clears throat> we figure that by working with two competing uh, entities, we'll actually uh, uh, get more done. Uh, and then by them competing with one another, they'll propel this forward. What that involves um, is actually taking T cells out of a human being introducing into those T cells what's called a chimeric antigen receptor. Um, uh, a chimeric antigen receptor is a, it, it, it's essentially a man-made molecule that incorporates many of the capabilities of, uh, of both signaling and targeting molecules in human beings. So it actually is a receptor which on the outside recognizes a molecule on lymphoma cells called CD19. And that receptor it consists of an antibody that can specifically recognize CD19, can actually bind to it. And then that is tethered, linked, so actually linked in the same molecule, to a signaling molecule called the T cell zeta chain that causes T cells to expand and to be activated, essentially to get angry at an antigen, the same way they get angry at viruses, and to attack. Um, and last, that is tethered to another molecule called 41BB, which is a signaling molecule that gives the T cell the signal to continue its expansion uh, indefinitely. Because you know, if you think about it, when you have the flu, um, uh, about 10% of your circulating T cells or your lymphocytes that are trying to get rid of the flu may actually be specifically directed against influenza A and B. And one of the problems we've had in cancer immunotherapy for years and years is we haven't been able to jack up the number of cells. We've, we've been able to identify cells which will recognize cancer for a long time, but to actually um, jack up the number of cells that would attack the cancer uh, to where they had critical mass and there were enough cells that could attack cancer was a, um, a daunting task that we were not successful at for many years. So it turns out um, that we're actually much better at it now, and I'll explain how in a minute. Um, <clears throat> in the case of these chimeric antigen receptor T cells, what we do is we artificially, in the laboratory, create T cells that specifically recognize cancer cells uh, and specifically will expand when they encounter a cancer cell uh, and 
attack cancer cells when they encounter cancer cells. So this is, we're essentially arming the T cells, and we do that by retargeting the T cell. So all those T cells are normal T cells. We borrow a page from viruses. We actually use a modified virus called a lentivirus. It's, it's actually from the same family of viruses uh, as HIV that can insert the DNA for what we want produced in the cell into the cell. And then we put that, uh, we're able to change millions or billions of T cells in the laboratory into these retargeted cells. And then if you infuse a small number into the patient, um, then as soon as they encounter uh, cancer cells, whether they be acute lymphoblastic lymphoma cells or uh, leukemia cells or diffuse large B cells, uh, diffuse, lar uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma cells or chronic lymphocytic CLL cells, then as soon as they encounter these cells, then, th then these T cells will expand. They not only expand, uh, but we can detect signs of their engaging um, these cancer cells and destroying them because they release all kinds of um, molecules we call cytokines. Uh, patients actually get fevers the way you do with influenza um, a, because these cells expand so rapidly and attack tumors so vigorously. And we know now from the original experiments were done about four or five years ago, we know now that these cells will persist for years and when the cancer is gone, they subside the same way that a natural response to, for example, a virus subsides. You might have 10% of your cells directed against influenza when you have the flu, um, or against herpes if all of a sudden you have a herpetic ulcer. And then as soon as the immune system is done at attacking the flu and getting rid of it, you know, the number of cells that you see will become that, that are directed against the flu will be vanishingly small. And these retargeted CAR T cells, or chimer chimeric antigen receptor T cells, are, uh, do the same thing. They expand rapidly. Uh, patients get fevers. Um, the chronic lymphocytic leukemia disappears. The uh, acute lymphoblastic lymphoma disappears. Um, and or uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, disappears. This is going to revolutionize um, what we do. And, uh, and the early indications are, I mean, this is still in the embryonic phase, um, uh, but it's not that embryonic because the patients that have been treated are getting uh, complete remissions, or some are getting stable disease, but most of the patients are, are actually getting complete remissions, and these are, many of these are patients that have failed transplant or are ineligible for transplant uh, because they're too old. Or, or, or they're too uh, frail medically. So this is something um, that has moved to the fore uh, in the past few years. I was reading an article the other day. I started, uh, I spent a lot of my life in tumor immunology, and I can tell you um, that seven, eight years ago, um, we were kind of the has-beens of uh, cancer research. And then two years ago, an antibody um, that was introduced, uh, we also were involved in testing in melanoma and renal cell carcinoma, to a molecule called PD-1. Um, it was introduced and found to be extraordinarily active in melanoma and renal cell uh, uh, carcinoma, actually approved by the FDA. And that antibody is a, what's called a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and that reinvigorated tumor immunology to where the journal Science, um, which is kind of the premier journal in, uh, in medical research, um, that journal had that antibody on the cover uh, and called it the molecule of the year. Well, for years, one of our investigators, Eckerd Podak, for years said that he thought that there was something about um, lung cancer that was turning off the immune system. 
um, and that you could actually immunize people against their lung cancer. And we did some trials, and he developed certain technologies that are now in clinical testing nationally. Uh, some were uh, tested at our center, and some are now going to be tested at other centers due to conflict of interest because the university owns the rights. Um, and he was able to get some responses. But with the handbrakes on, you're not going to get much of a response. Well, what happens if you give a lung cancer patient an anti-PD-1 antibody? Well, for the first time in years, we're seeing a high rate of remissions in lung cancer, provided that the lung cancer expresses PDL1. So if the lung cancer expresses PDL1, it will switch on the handbrakes. If you block the interaction between the molecule on its surface, PDL1 and PD1, uh, you can get immune attack on lung cancers. And actually, when you combine two molecules, another um, checkpoint inhibitor molecule called anti-CTLA-4, apilimumab, also initially approved in melanoma. When you combine that with an anti-PD-1 antibody in lung cancer, we're seeing very, very high rates of remission. And it was a big surprise the other day. The lymphoma guys, like myself, did not think that this mechanism was too important in lymphoma. Um, but like many things we thought, we were completely wrong. There was a very nice article in the New England Journal the other day uh, that say that Hodgkin's disease um, and other lymphomas, but this article is about Hodgkin's disease, um, actually expresses very high levels of PDL1 on its surface. And um, when they took patients who had failed bone marrow transplant, who were at the end of the line and failed Another molecule called uh, adcitrus or brentuximab, which, by the way, uh, it was a new uh, treatment for uh, lymphoma that was approved based on University of Miami research. Um, when they failed all known treatments uh, for lymphoma and were pretty much at the end of the line with a life expectancy of about six months or so, um, it turns out that they took 23 patients, treated them with this checkpoint inhibitor, anti-PD-1, and what happened was um, that 87% of those patients, 100% of those patients had a decrease in the size of their Hodgkin's disease. 87% uh, of those patients either, either had a complete response or a partial response, meaning greater than 50% reduction in Hodgkin's lymphoma. So all along, it was sitting there for us to discover, um, um, but we just didn't know. So I'll, I'll finish by saying that we are um, entering an era of personalized medicine, where the realization is that everybody's cancer is unique, but where we have the molecular tools, be that genomics, kinome analysis, proteomics, including at our center, to interrogate every cancer, identify its weak spots, identify driver mutations, um, um, and, and to begin to interdict uh, the biology of those cancers uh, by directly targeting what's wrong. Okay, and uh, with those cancers, it's a very exciting era. I'm very thankful for uh, what the PAP Corps provides us to do because um, I have an interesting life in part because people like you are very supportive of research, so thank you.